Hi, I'm Ali Patterson. On this episode of FinTech Finance, we head over to California to speak with Anomaly and Bank of the West. Back over in Europe, we catch up with Danske Bank over in Denmark and the European Banking Federation over in Belgium, where we look at cybersecurity and the effect that this has on the customer as well as around regulation like GDPR. So firstly, I caught up with Hugh from Anomaly to hear about the methods that they employ in order to detect hackers in the system. Uh, typically, most attacks happen in several stages that might occur over minutes, hours, weeks, months. Uh, depending on the size of the organization, it could be several months from the time an attacker actually starts to compromise a system to the time when they execute sort of their, their payload um, target, which is maybe exfiltrating intellectual property, stealing money, compromising customers' accounts. And the way that Anomaly helps with that is to actually provide capabilities that allow detection at multiple different stages. So rather than waiting for the ultimate breach, uh, an attack can be detected in progress at the stage where people are still laying the groundwork. And the way we do that is by using threat intelligence to identify the presence of bad actors uh, in early stages, for example, when they're doing reconnaissance to see if a system can be breached, uh, maybe when they do an initial breach and then start proliferating across the organization, um, at the time when they're actually, for example, stealing um, corporate intelligence property, intellectual property, and sending it to another network. Uh, we also help to detect when they do command and control activity, which is essentially sort of phoning home to um, the mothership, the bad, the bad guys there, and uh, transferring information or requesting instructions. Um, so at all of those different stages of a compromise, uh, including also trying to propagate to another victim, uh, we have tools and techniques to detect those. And so the idea is the earlier stage in a breach at which you can detect something, the more likely it is, not that you're going to prevent being breached, because it may have already happened, but that you're going to catch it before it has resulted in losses. Over in Belgium, I went to speak with Wim from the European Banking Federation to hear a little bit around how cybersecurity feeds into GDPR. So we are doing everything, and let me explain that. This means that we respond now to GDPR, to the implementation. We are talking to the so-called Article 29 Committee, who deals with the implementation of, uh, of, of data protection. But we're also, again, creating awareness, trying to discuss how this works. Because, again, the, the interesting thing about GDPR is that there are some revolutionary parts in it, but there are also parts in it that go from a traditional data protection, uh, protection uh, system in a digital world. And how to marry these and how to administrate this is a huge task. So we're reacting to the implementation itself, but we're also trying to figure out with experts on how to interpret the different, uh, the different rules in there. Over in Denmark, I sent Doug McKenzie to speak with Thomas from Danske Bank to talk a little bit around the vast amount of data that there is and how this affects the customer experience. I think we can use data to make the customers feel financial uh, comfortable. Uh, and we can do that uh, in a number of ways. So there's the very basic stuff that uh, data can be used to tell me that I usually pay my phone bill every month, but this month I haven't put it up for, for paying. Did I forget to do something? So that kind of reminding me, helping me, can also help me see that me and my wife are both subscribing to, to the same HBO or, or whatever it would be, so to save some money there. Then you can take that on to the more advanced states, which is much more, you know, people like you do this and that the other. So that could make me more confident about and, and more knowledge about. So people my age, my earnings save more, save less than me. So sort of make me understand my own financial situation uh, better. And that can then be taken into having more advanced levels of, of uh, actually becoming, uh, you know, close to advising and sort of uh, the more advanced we do this, sort of uh, mapping out me uh, as against to, to other peer groups. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be, uh, to be gained there in actually making the customers feeling on top of their own financials and, and helping them out. Well, we just recently had a change of the, of the law here in Denmark because we've been prohibited to do a lot of stuff uh, within the payments area and, and informing our customers about that. So we're now we're looking in, 
we have done with some of the other markets looking into making this kind of service available for our customers. And then that, like, that's an area where we do some ourselves, but it's also an area where we do team up with, uh, with FinTechs, uh, some of the services they're providing and in terms of, of making me aware of what I do uh, with my money, etc. And we were the first banks, I think it's more than five years ago, actually to introduce the spending overview for our customers. So showing you on a monthly or yearly basis where have you spent your money, what kind of categories do your spending go into. And that has been very well received by our customers. And I think now that the legislation has changed, we're able to build on top of that. Uh, some will develop ourselves and some will work together with fintechs and, uh, and, and see how can we make this even more uh, intuitive and, and giving the customer the knowledge of you know, my spending uh, and, and making it much easier to, to act upon it. Back over in the States, I spoke a bit more with Hugh around the effect that GDPR is going to have on the industry. So. Uh, GDPR, like, like other regulations, um, can have several effects on an industry. Uh, one of the effects is people, uh, organizations uh, affected, have to start thinking in terms of um, business trade-offs. So for example, if you have a regulation that comes with fines that are enforced for non-compliance, it becomes essentially mandatory for the organization to think about do we have the right processes in place, do we have the right tools, are people well trained, um, and it soon becomes more expensive to pay fines than to implement the controls and the techniques to, uh, to comply. And so that generally results in activity on the part of the organizations that can be beneficial to their customers as a whole. And really, ultimately, what that depends on is how well the regulation is crafted. If the regulation is crafted in ways that promote useful behavior changes on the part of the institutions that are implementing it, then you will see uh, an upgrade in the defensive capabilities of those organizations and hopefully a decrease in the vulnerability of the individuals that are trusting those organizations like people who have bank accounts. As a European Bank Federation is in the regulatory environment so what we are currently doing is on cybersecurity as I said creating awareness and fostering cooperation so with ENISA and the European uh, Cybersecurity Alliance, Europol and with fintechs and one of the important things for instance with fintechs because we do believe that the banks are fintechs, but you also have fintech startups who sometimes pick out really brilliant ideas and in, in the value chain. So we are trying to create a platform because for us this is also awareness because everybody in the ecosystem needs to be aware. So our, our fintech platform which we are launching, of which we have launched, is very important now to have we these kind of discussions because that's trust. And again, if you want innovation, we need our own fintech, we need fintech startups, but we need to continue to have trust. So that's part. Literacy, awareness is the other thing. And not only cybersecurity, but broader. The more money becomes virtual, the more it becomes important that you have the, the, the tools, that you have the understanding to work with it. It already starts with, with children having an electronic wallet and finding out that after 15 ice creams it's suddenly empty to SMEs who need financing, who need to have the basic things, to indeed awareness on cybersecurity. And again here, uh, fintech startups can help us because they have a, a huge spread among young people. And finally, indeed, uh, today uh, we also uh, signed an SME feedback, uh, um, uh, feedback, high-level principles on SME feedback on loans with Commissioner Dombrovsky. We work closely with the European Commission on, again, on awareness, on trust, on knowing the place of banks in society today, eh, with the physical branches easily to view, to see, but also in future when they become more virtual. We also spoke with Jamie Armistead from Bank of the West in San Francisco around flexibility for the future and the need to bring various departments together. And, and I think the most important part is thinking about it from a customer experience perspective. And so we've started to employ tools like journey mapping to understand how a customer becomes a customer. Um, and if it's a, the first time they're coming into a branch or they're going online to open a checking account, what does that experience look like end to end? Uh, customers naturally move between channels all the time. They research a product online, they might have a phone call, they might end up in a branch. Customers don't think, oh, I'm channel switching, but from a bank perspective, they are. 
And so we need to ensure that all of those things are stitched together. So it comes back to data and information and ensuring we understand how that customer is navigating the bank uh, and then ensuring our customer, our, our communications uh, tie together all that data and information. So it's intelligent. So we actually know that I started here and I moved to the branch and then we did a we did a, uh, an email follow up and then we did an outbound phone call to onboard you to ensure that uh, all the all the products and services are working accordingly and make sure that you uh, you're satisfied with uh, with with your your experience thus far at Bank of the West and so we use those types of tools like journey mapping to try to look at those those customer touch points from end to end uh, and try to work to ensure that those are seamless experiences I wouldn't say that we have it all all perfect uh, it's it's constantly evolving Evolving and rapidly changing, and so um, bringing mobile into the mix. Now we're doing, you know, more, more and more mobile advertising. How do I ensure that my mobile advertising uh, takes advantage of and understands what what relationships the customer already has and what they're what they might have done at the branch or that they visit the ATM? So it's a it's a it's a continual work in progress, um, but something that we're certainly is certainly top of mind, and we're trying to use different tools to ensure that we deliver consistent customer experience across those channels and across those product areas. How do you ensure that you don't have that each person's customer data is all together and it's almost like a segment of one uh, which well, actually that's the goal to reach the point where you have a segment of one but yeah. how, how do you how what's your approach to sort of try and reach that level uh, well I mean we've we've done it through how we've uh, structured some of the uh, some of our, our marketing engines behind the scenes are able to pinpoint at the customer level and so we are trying to get to that segment of one you certainly start with broader segments um, and so, you know, they get treated as a group within a population. But then, uh, once you once you look at the customer relationship and bring that into play, it, it does it does really rapidly end up at sort of segment of one because you may have different products than I have. You may use dis different digital services than I have, and so by drawing from that marketing engine is drawing from you know 30 or 40 sort of opportunities it will pinpoint what is the what what is the best opportunity for you um, and and talk to you about remote deposit or talk to me about our bill pay service or talk to you about e statement so it's really pinpointing what next next capability might be best for your relationship back over in Denmark Doug spoke with Danske Bank to hear a little bit more around trends in the digital space Obviously, the main thing is that customers are using the brands less uh, than they did before. So if we compare 2011 to 15, only a four-year period, we actually saw that the average customers would be using it once a month uh, back in 11, down to now once a year in 15. So a huge decrease there. But don't uh, underestimate sort of then when they do go to the brands, they, those are the core moments for the, for the customers. Uh, and where you probably have seen early on that you would have become a walk to the brands with, with uh, more nitty gritty stuff. Now you're there for the for the moments that matters, and and we we definitely still need to, to be there because it is a strong driver for for the customer satisfaction and the loyalty that we do have a good branch network and, and able to to give that advice when the customers uh, want it. There are multiple different uh, pieces of the puzzle, if you will, when you're trying to uh, defend organizations. Um, one of the things that we think is incredibly important is to be able to take the information that we already have about bad actors and threats and apply it to defenses. And so I guess I could explain that by saying there are tools whose job is to detect malicious activity as it happens. And so if you were going to do uh, an airport analogy, uh, you would want tools that could detect uh, knives and luggage, guns and luggage, etc. And then you would want to prevent people that had those uh, weapons on them from boarding a plane. But what if you have somebody that's already known to be a bad guy and he wants to fly, then a simple technique for that person would be to fly without a gun or a knife on him that day. And then he would get through those defenses. The metal detectors wouldn't find anything, so he would be good. So clearly, if it's Osama bin Laden trying to fly, you may not want him flying whether he's got a gun on him or not. And so what airports do is they have what they call no-fly lists. And so what we are doing is something very similar, which is implementing a digital version of the no-fly lists that allows us to identify bad guys on your network, whether or not they are already in the process of committing nefarious activity. So the idea is to be able to alert people uh, as soon as there is questionable actors on their network. They don't have to already be engaged in 
in the crime. You just need to know that they shouldn't be there. Now, um, we have Stacks. Stacks is a free tool that makes it easy for people to get access to these kind of lists of bad actors and uh, download them for use in protecting their network. Uh, Anomaly Enterprise is a tool that actually lets you identify if somebody tells you about a new zero-day exploiter uh, attack that's just been discovered, um, it can let you find out, have I been exposed to this over the past year, over the past two years? And ThreatStream basically is a tool that lets you um, take that information and actually deploy it inside your security operations center with the tools that you're already using, tools like Splunk, ArcSight, IBM QRadar, and so forth, and enable those tools to basically detect activity that involves actors that we are on the lookout for. And so all these tools work in concert um, and provide powerful techniques. In addition, our platform supports what we call circles of trust, where multiple organizations can decide to share critical intelligence information with each other. So that, for example, if a, if a bank got breached, what you would want is you would want all the other banks to become aware of the particular nature of the threat so that the attacker would only have the element of surprise on the first victim rather than all victims. Do banks tend to sort of share that information freely? Um, they do. They do. They in fact have, for example, in the US, an organization called the um, FSISAC, which is the Financial Services Information Sharing Group. And that organization exists for the purpose of facilitating security-based information sharing among banks. Um, there are now organizations like that in multiple verticals. So you have the same thing now for retail, you have it for IT, uh, you have it for healthcare. And so this is a very powerful technique and it's becoming more popular. And so that's actually one of the ways you can distinguish between different uh, technology providers. Uh, this is something that for us is a very strong uh, area of um, technology um, research and deployment for us is to essentially we curate all the sources. There are many sources of intelligence out there. Some of them are commercial vendors. Some of them are community provided free sources and they have varying levels of quality. So a lot of what we provide to the, um, to the enterprises is vetted, um, cleaned up feeds with the whole idea being to reduce the um, incidence of false positives and increase the detectability of actionable incidents. The, the FinTech platform is new for, for all of us. It was born out of need. We, we saw that many of the FinTech startups have a great idea but are struggling with the heavily regulated environment for banks. And we know, we know this stuff at the European level and they usually have their idea and want to get on with their idea and they are not ready to spend millions on, on a European lawyer telling them what the European law was. So we want to work, want to work together. So the, the startup is first, we started very easily because again, we're, we're, we don't want to push. For us, it's a dialogue in getting the regulatory environment right. So we will start with some meetings, just trying to see where their problems are in the regulatory environment and explaining where ours are. Um, and then we hope to move on with providing basic knowledge that we, that, we, that we all need. We need to share it because it's a little bit like a, a shared open platform for regulatory affairs. Because on this regulatory platform we want to build new banks and that is the main idea that we have with the platform. So we hope actually that as many fintechs as possible who are trying, struggling with the regulatory environment, are struggling with European law, come to us and see if we can help. On the next episode of Fintech Finance, we take a look at some of the methods employed to really manage data effectively. 